Thank you so much. Um, we're just going to get started here. If you haven't texted, probably a good time to do it. Um, just before I introduce um, this week's speaker, just a reminder for Grand Rounds next week, um, and it's going to be Dr. Jose Mate. so please look out for your emails with details about Grand Rounds next week. Um, today we have a very exciting uh, speaker who needs very little to no introduction um, in this audience, but I'm going to introduce him anyways. Uh, Dr. Silvio Nzucci is a professor of medicine here at Yale, uh, director of the Yale Medicine Diabetes Center and clinical director um, of the section of endocrinology. Again, you all know him. He's uh, really sort of, you know, one of the stalwarts here at Yale. Uh, he's a native New Yorker from the other end of the Metro North Line, um, had his undergraduate degree at Fordham and his medical degree at Harvard Medical School, um, after which he came here to Yale and has been here for too long. <laughs> um, and uh, as you know, he's really, really very well known, very well respected here at Yale nationally and internationally. Um, he's authored an incredible number of manuscripts in the leading journals, New England Journal, JAMA. Um, he is a former member of the editorial board of Diabetes Care and associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. His research interests, I think, are very, um, very relevant um, in general and in particular uh, to this audience. Uh, really has investigated the link between type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, and cardiovascular complications, and has a particular interest um, in the evaluation of the asymptomatic diabetic patient uh, for coronary artery disease. As we're talking a little bit um, before this, that really is an area in which there is a significant amount of overlap and one that I think is a little bit under-recognized, um, especially in the cardiovascular or in the cardiology population. And certainly we've had a number of talks in this Grand Round series uh, that have been related to cardiometabolic disease and I'm very interested um, to hear his take on this. So um, without sort of taking up too much more time, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Nzuchi, but also to say that I don't know about you guys, but I'm personally sort of uh, here for the punchline to a diabetologist, a cardiologist, and a nephrologist walk into a bar. I think my money is on the cardiologist, Dr. Nzuchi. Thank you very much. I think the cardiologist should pick up the tab, don't you? <laughs> So when uh, we started talking about this Grand Rounds, I was uh, speaking to Tarek to come up with a catchy title. I'm not sure I do have a punchline, but I think the, the point is that um, we all see the same uh, types of patients, and we're kind of taking it from a different uh, perspective. And uh, these guys go into the bar, and they see Lenny. <laughs> and I say, you know, I wonder what his A1C is. Henry might say, who cares about his A1C? I'd rather know his coronary artery calcium score. And the nephrologist says, no, no, let's just check his uh, GFR. And I think that uh, raises uh, the question that's reflected in this you know, famous fable, right, that five blind men or five blindfolded men were looking at the elephant from a different uh, perspective. I imagine that's the cardiologist closest to the heart. That's probably the diabetologist obsessed with the feet. And I think we know where the <laughs> nephrologist will be. I think we'll, we'll make this the neurologist, right, near the brain. And since OSA is a big issue in obesity, I think near the nostrils will be the pulmonologist. So uh, the way I've structured the talk is to first uh, convince you that glucose control means nothing for cardiovascular outcomes. Then we'll look at the current landscape of uh, type 2 diabetes therapies. And here we're getting into the notion about whether a specific diabetes drug, really probably through an off-target effect, because if you believe, number one, that glucose control itself doesn't do much for cardiovascular out outcomes, uh, perhaps uh, some of the non-glycemic effects of medications may 
uh, reduce cardiovascular events. And then we'll talk about two drug classes, the SGLT2 inhibitors of GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, I've actually attended a few grand rounds this year, and I know that you've gone over these. I'll give you the kind of the diabetologist perspective on these new data. Um, then we'll talk about updated treatment guidelines and uh, time permitting. I'll go through very quickly just kind of my tips and tricks about using specifically the SGLT2 inhibitors. We won't have time to look at the GLP-1 receptor agonists. I suspect if cardiologists start prescribing these medications, it's probably going to be the oral SGLT2s as opposed to the injectable GLP-1s. I may be wrong on that, but maybe you'll have me back next year to talk about the GLP-1 receptor agonists. So uh, this is a slide that I've used for years, and it underscores a very important point that whether you're talking about uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, that the effect on microvascular complications is clear. I mean, the reason we lower glucose is to prevent our patients from going blind, from needing to visit the nephrologist uh, on a three times a week basis, if you know what I mean, um, or losing their toes. And that's, that's the reason we control blood glucose, is to reduce microvascular complications. Again, type 1, type 2, that's really not an argument anymore. What has been um, somewhat controversial is the effect on cardiovascular uh, disease, as you know. Think about it. The major complication of diabetes in terms of mortality is actually cardiovascular events. The major metabolic um, uh, manifestation of uh, diabetes, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, is actually hyperglycemia, yet correcting the hyperglycemia uh, doesn't do anything to reduce those cardiovascular events. It's always been a bit of a conundrum. In fact, in one uh, trial, which was the ACCORD trial that looked at high-risk patients, older patients with type 2 diabetes, um, actually mortality, mainly cardiovascular mortality, was actually increased in those patients that were randomized to the uh, tighter uh, control arm of that uh, trial. Like anything, it gets a little bit more complicated than that because when you follow these patients long term, you actually begin to detect a small benefit on cardiovascular events. This is in the range of perhaps 14 to 15 percent relative risk reduction. Clearly pales in comparison to the effects on microvascular disease or any of your cardiovascular therapies like blood pressure control uh, and statin therapy. So I think the implication here is that in the short term, three to five years of a clinical trial, uh, you don't see anything on cardiovascular events, certainly not on cardiovascular mortality and nothing on heart failure. But if you follow patients long term, unfortunately, after the randomized component of the trial is over, so there is a little bit of uh, uh, controversy as to whether patients are really, uh, the, the, whether their improved cardiovascular events can really be ascribed to the original therapy because often the hemoglobin A1C is actually uh, coalesce after uh, they're uh, out of the trial for about a year or so. Um, but uh, suffice to say that non-fatal MI in these long-term follow-up studies does show a slight improvement in those patients that were originally randomized to the uh, intensive arm of the trial. So there may be a long-term effect of good diabetes control, but in the short term, uh, hardly anything at all. Well, let's talk about the type 2 diabetes therapies that we do. Before we do that, let's review the the pathogenesis of uh, type 2 diabetes, because I feel very strongly that if you understand the pathogenesis of diabetes, the way the drugs work uh, is almost second nature. So type 2 diabetes is complicated. Type 1 is pretty easy. You have autoimmune destruction of beta cells. Beta cells make insulin. You can't make insulin. You can't gluco get, get glucose inside the cells. Patients become hyperglycemic and, uh, in some circumstances, ketotic because of the lack of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the disease actually starts in peripheral tissues. It's actually a muscle disease. The muscle's resistant to the action of insulin, so it can't get glucose inside. And therefore, the pancreas makes more insulin to the point of becoming fatigued. We use that term, pancreatic fatigue. Not exactly sure what that means, but uh, the pancreas cannot sustain the hyperinsulinemic response. And now you have a decrement in insulin secretion not to the point of type 1 diabetes, just a modest decrease initially. And the body still requires more insulin to get glucose inside. So that combination of insufficient pancreatic response to peripheral insulin resistance is a recipe for hyperglycemia. The liver is also involved. The liver produces excess glucose in patients with type 2 diabetes. It's also insulin resistant. Uh, insulin actually should 
reduce hepatic glucose production. Uh, there's this incretin system, which is this neuroendocrine discussion between the GI tract and the endocrine pancreas to make more insulin and less glucagon after eating. That's deranged in diabetes. The kidney's involved. It's not putting out enough glucose. We usually put out glucose when our plasma concentration hits 180, and type 2 diabetes is more like 230 or 240. And the brain is probably playing a role here in terms of the dysregulation of each of these pathophysiological defects in obesity. So that's the complex um, pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. And the seven main drugs that we use each are targeted at one of these defects. So the most popular medication, metformin, reduces hepatic glucose production. The thiazoldinediones that have actually fallen on <coughs> hard times in the past uh, five to seven years, they improve insulin resistance in peripheral tissues. Insulin, we all know how insulin works. Sulfonylureas increase insulin secretion. The alphabet soup, the GLP-1 agonists and the DPP-4 inhibitors target the incretin system. These are injectables for the most part. These are tablets. And then finally, the SGLT2 inhibitors um, increase glucose excretion through the urine. It's even easier than that because when you think about it, there are seven drugs for diabetes. Uh, there are three categories that contain two drugs and one that's alone. So two are insulin providing drugs, two are insulin sensitizing drugs, TZDs in muscle, metformin in liver. Uh, there are two drugs that enhance the incretin system, and the one that stands alone increases glucose excretion. So two, 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 and one, it's seven drugs for diabetes. It actually is that simple. <laughs> um, obviously, each of these categories has many representatives. They have uh, generic names, they have trade names, they have a certain effect on A1C, they each have a mechanism of action, and they each have positives and negatives in terms of their uh, effect, not only on glucose control, but on other uh, parameters related to the cardiovascular system. And unfortunately, many, particularly the newer ones, are extremely expensive. A lot of these drugs now are in the $400 to $800 per month range whereas you can get a sulfonylurea or even uh, metformin for about four bucks at your local Walmart. The two drug categories that we're going to be focusing on are the ones that now have clear cardiovascular benefits and in the circumstance of the SGLT2 inhibitors, a clear renal benefit. And it's, I think it's critical for a cardiologist to understand where the data is um, should they be prescribing these medications in concert with primary care doctors and endocrinologists, and what the expectations might be. So in the past, this is the original uh, position statement from the American Diabetes Association. We put this together in 2012 and updated in 2015. These were the dark ages of diabetes therapy, because we knew how the drugs worked. We knew how they lowered glucose. We knew a little bit about side effects and maybe some added bonuses like weight loss or <coughs> blood pressure reduction. But we had very little evidence on their cardiovascular effects because those required the long-term clinical trials that I'll review in a few, slide, but, uh, a few slides. But here we started with lifestyle change, quickly moved to metformin. And then after metformin, where there was widespread agreement, after metformin, you could basically do what you want. If you had an individual paying out of pocket, you'd use a sulfonylurea. If you thought your patient was very insulin resistant, you'd add a TZD. If you had a patient that had side effects with everything you ever prescribed to that patient, you'd give them a DPP-4 inhibitor, because these are relatively neutral in terms of adverse effects. If the patients wanted to lose weight, you could use an SGLT2 inhibitor. As long as they didn't have urinary issues like BPH, I mean, you really had to individualize. If the patient didn't mind injecting and wanted to lose more weight, you'd use a GLP-1. If the patient was way far from their A1C target, you'd use the, the ultimate treatment in terms of efficacy, which would be insulin. And then if two drugs didn't work, you'd use three. And ultimately, you move down the path toward multiple daily injections, typically of insulin, although 
there was an emerging um, concept of using a basal insulin with the GLP-1 agonist, but basically injectable therapies. Now, there's a lot of organs on this slide, but you'll notice that the one organ that's missing is the heart, probably important to most of you uh, in this audience. And I think that the Food and Drug Administration, as you know, in 2008, got very interested in this. We don't have time to go into the history here, but several drugs came onto the market or were in late stages of clinical development that had surprising potential cardiovascular risk. And uh, one of the drugs, Avandia, which was rosiglitazone, a TZD, actually almost came off the market because the meta-analysis had suggested that this drug that had been used for four or five years in diabetes that came onto the market because it was supposed to be a beneficial drug for the cardiovascular system. It was an insulin sensitizer. Insulin resistance was bad. This was like the holy grail of diabetes treatment. A meta-analysis, which was later uh, refuted by a randomized clinical trial, suggested that there was an increase in myocardial infarction events with that medication. So the FDA kind of regrouped and said, oh, let's just put the brakes on drug development here in, in, the, in the diabetes space. And let's uh, mandate that any new drug that comes to the US market, this is later taken up by the EMA in, in uh, the European Union, any new drug that comes to market, let's just be sure that there's no cardiovascular risk. We've given up on efficacy, right? I mean, there's no effect of glucose control. Um, most of the drugs, when studied individually, did not have a cardiovascular benefit, with the exception of maybe metformin in small trials. but. They were strictly interested in safety to prevent another fiasco like the, uh, what happened with uh, Vandia. So this led to almost a cottage industry of these large cardiovascular outcome trials. And they're seen here, the, up top of the DPP-4 inhibitors. Those were the uh, lucky drug class that was the first in line when the FDA came out with that guidance in 2008. Then the GLP-1 receptor agonists, these are the mostly injectable. I say most because one of the GLP-1s is now available in an oral formulation, although I, I don't think it's in the, in the pharmacies yet. And at the bottom are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Those are the drugs that increase glycosuria uh, through, the, uh, through the urine. I won't bore you with the DPP-4 data. Neutral. P people complained, but these were successful trials, right? The FDA wanted... No risk, they got no risk. But it was, it was, it was kind of underwhelming because we were still hopeful, diabetologists were always hopeful that something about controlling diabetes would reduce cardiovascular events. So we were very disappointed with these trials. But at the end of the day, they, they demonstrated what they were set up to demonstrate, which is cardiovascular safety. So if you have a patient who has cardiovascular disease and you want to control their glucose, you can at least be sure with a small exception that if you prescribe a DPP-4 inhibitor, um, the most famous one is citagliptin, which is marketed as Genuvia. That's one of the more popular diabetes medications. You won't be doing harm to your patient. I say mostly because one of the drugs, saxagliptin, had this curious increase in, in heart failure episodes uh, in its, uh, in its uh, trial, which was called Saver Timmy. I think it was a 24, 25% increase in heart failure hospitalization. Not seen with any other DPP-4 trial. It could have been a flu. It could be something specific with the medication. We're not sure. But in terms of MACE, which is what the primary outcome for these trials uh, was powered for, absolute neutrality. The first of the uh, GLP-1s, I might add, uh, lixizenotide was also neutral. But this, this was an ACS population. And if you want to prove neutrality, uh, in a cardiovascular population, pick an ACS population because a lot of the events are front-loaded and it's kind of a silly trial, but it, it, it led to some consternation that even the GLP-1s, which led to weight loss and may have some cardiovascular beneficial effects on lipids and blood pressure, even the GLP-1s were uh, going to be neutral on cardiovascular disease. So then came the SGLT2 inhibitor uh, trials, and let's review those uh, to some detail. These are, this is the, the physiology of how the nephron handles glucose. I think Mikhail Kozborov was here about three or four weeks ago and showed a similar slide. But basically, glucose is filtered. Um, we need to conserve energy, so the proximal nephron is charged with resorbing any glucose that's filtered. And 90% of that is through a transporter known as a sodium glucose co-transporter, number one. Number two is 
is mainly expressed in the gut, and it has only a small role uh, in the uh, nephron. So at the end of the day, unless your blood glucose hits 180, you're going to uh, excrete minimal glucose. Try it. Dip your urine. Should be if, if it's if it's positive, let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> Now, if you block the SGLT2 inhibitor, you increase glucose excretion, and you lose about 70 to 80 grams per day. This is fascinating. The, the threshold is reduced from 180 down to less than 70. So if your blood sugar is 70, you're still putting out glucose. Now, you might say, well, why don't we get hypoglycemic? Because in the body has counter-regulatory mechanisms, it decreases insulin, you don't get hypoglycemic. If you use it with insulin and you're already tightly controlled, you might precipitate hypoglycemia, but that's insulin's problem. It's not the SGLT2's problem. And that translates to about 300 <coughs> calories per day loss. So if you do the math, the, the math um, and you know that there's 3,500 calories to the pound, I've calculated this. In 7.2 years, a 100 kilogram person would disappear. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, that doesn't happen. You lose about two kilos because, again, the body has compensatory mechanisms to probably increase calorie intake. But you do lose calories on a daily basis. So, before the cardiovascular outcome trials, this was kind of the risk benefit uh, analysis of the SGLT2s. Like all drugs, they have positives and negatives. They reduced uh, A1C. Uh, they did it in an insulin-independent fashion, so you could use it at any point in the disease course. H low hypoglycemia rates. You lose weight. Your blood pressure goes down because of the S, right? There's an SGLT2, so you lose a little bit of sodium. So it works um, as a diuretic in part. Um, it had a beneficial effects on urinary albumin. Uh, triglycerides went down. HDL went up. Sounded pretty good. As you might expect, if you have glucose in your urine, you have an increased rates of urinary issues. So polyuria, uh, that could be problematic in a gentleman with uh, significant BPH. Um, yeast infections, mainly in women, but also in uncircumcised men. Uh, not so much for urinary tract infections. That was a concern initially, but the large trials don't show any imbalance. Uh, DKA, is, which is interesting, it's mainly a phenomenon in type 1, where you should not be using <coughs> these drugs, although there is an off-label use of these drugs in the United States in type 1. We'll talk about that. Um, there is a reversible drop in GFR, which is interesting. It actually may be a good thing, like the drop in GFR with a RAS blocker. A uh, small increase in LDL that never panned out to be uh, anything that was felt to be harmful. And one of the drugs, canagliflozin, increased uh, fracture rate. So again, like anything, even metformin, there's, there's positives and uh, negatives. And then came the Empereg outcome trial. And this was a landmark trial because it was the first time that a glucose-lowering drug had been associated with a substantial improvement in cardiovascular outcomes, specifically the most important cardiovascular outcome, which is CD death. And here we saw a 38% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. And notably, there was this perplexing, very early divergence of the event curves. Those of you that read or do cardiovascular studies, you know that most of these hypertension drugs, uh, lipid-lowering therapies, the, the, the uh, diversion of these curves typically happens at about one year. So something that was happening very early on, maybe it's a hemodynamic effect, maybe it's working through heart failure, we're not exactly clear but it was very distinctive for this specific drug class and this specific drug, perhaps. So this is now the four major trials before DAP-HF, which I'll also mention. These were in a diabetic population, and Credence was a diabetic renal population. Each of these were uh, enriched with patients with overt cardiovascular disease, so no primary prevention patients in Empereg, 34% in Canvas, 59% in Declare, and about 50% in uh, Credence. And you can see that with ampagliflozin, the, the first uh, SGLT2 inhibitor to show a benefit, <coughs> there were significant benefits, not only on MACE and on CV death, uh, but also on heart failure hospitalization, which has uh, made this drug very exciting for heart failure 
specialists of the past uh, few years, as well in, as in the um, CKD progression outcome, which was a secondary outcome. And each of the subsequent trials, the, the um, specific components of MACE were a little bit uh, different. Um, this is the Credence uh, study, which was focused on patients with renal disease, diabetic kidney disease. Um, but you can see that the major uh, outcome in each of these trials was this large effect, more, almost the 30% in some, in some studies, and some studies more than 30%, on heart failure hospitalization. Now, what's interesting, this is a meta-analysis that was actually just uh, published in uh, the Journal of the American Heart Association. This is now looking at cardiovascular death. And remember, most of the patients in these trials, perhaps with the exception of DECLARE, were secondary prevention patients, right? They had overt cardiovascular disease. And you can see that in terms of CD death, all of the benefit is in that group. There seems to be very little benefit. Uh, in patients without overt cardiovascular disease. In contrast, however, when you look at the heart failure episodes, and this is true whether you dichotomize the patients on uh, the presence or absence of ASCVD or the presence or absence of heart failure, I won't show you the, those data, but um, the effect is seen in both primary and secondary prevention. So that's a very important point uh, with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, why is there this effect? It's not anti-atherosclerotic, right? Because of the, you, you saw the event curves. It just atherosclerosis can't can't uh, it can't work that quickly. So there's a lot of questions and and there's lots of uh, debate and opinions on how these drugs are uh, working. Most of us feel that this is a hemodynamic effect. I know I don't know if Jeff Testani's in the audience, but Jeff feels very strongly that this is a unique type of uh, diuretic. <laughs> Uh, that uh, is somehow offloading the ventricle and improving heart failure outcomes and maybe cardiovascular uh, mortality. I think there's a lot to know about this. We looked at the EMPEREG data specifically asking this question, what mediated the cardiovascular death effects of empagliflozin? And this is a mediation analysis. So you control for each of the covariates that you happen to have measured. And you see if you can move the hazard ratio toward one. And those that move the hazard ratio closest to one are probably important mediators. Maybe not cause and effect, but at least mediating uh, that effect. And you can see, much to my consternation, glucose had very little to do with anything. Uh, in fact, the mediator, the covariate that, that seemed to have been the most important for cardiovascular mortality and empiric outcome was hematocrit. And this. Uh, raises the question as to whether this is simply a manifestation of hemoconcentration, so that the, the more you hemoconcentrate a patient, the better they do. Some actually feel this may be an EPO effect, um, because erythropoietin actually does go up quickly after exposure to an SGLT2 inhibitor. Although in my mind, I'm not sure how increasing red blood cell mass to this degree, it's about a 3% increase in your hematocrit, how that can improve oxygen delivery an ischemic heart. It just doesn't make sense to me in terms of, I, I really think that it's more a reflection of offloading the ventricle and from hemoconcentration. And as you've probably heard, the, the DAPA-HF trial, which was uh, presented at the uh, European Society Cardiology meeting last uh, summer, was the first to find out if the SGLT2 inhibitors could potentially affect um, a cardiovascular population that didn't necessarily have diabetes. So this was a HEF-REF population. And you can see there was a 26% reduction in the primary outcome, which was worsening heart failure. That was mainly heart failure hospitalizations or CV death. And uh, we did not exclude patients with uh, diabetes. And when we looked at the point estimates for those patients with and without diabetes, you can see that we're, they were spot on. So clearly, uh, this drug class is benefiting heart failure outcomes, not through glucose, because it happens in patients who uh, are in a non-diabetic range. Admittedly, many of these patients, as you know, in a heart failure population have pre-diabetes, but trust me, this, is, this has nothing uh, to do with the uh, glucose. The other important observation in these trials, and this is where the nephrologists come in, 
are, is this effect on CKD progression. So this here is real. I mean, this is not just albuminuria, which is the main driver for any renal benefit with the other drug class that we'll be talking about, the GLP-1 agonist. This is, this is on hard renal outcomes uh, that is like a composite of uh, increases in creatinine, decreases in GFR, renal death, the need for uh, renal replacement therapy. Now, this is, again, very similar to the heart failure effect. This is in the range of about a 30% risk reduction and is consistent from drug to drug and trial to trial. And this is actually what happens to uh, GFR. So patients, this is from Empereg, uh, patients get randomized to placebo or one of two doses of empagliflozin. And again, there's this initial drop, very reminiscent of what happens with RAS blockade, right? A, a little bit of a hit on glomerular filtration, but then... Perhaps because of that, because you're offloading the, the glomerulus, you get this stabilization over time. And at the end of the day, at the end of three years, the patients on placebo have this inexorable decline that we see in patients with diabetic kidney disease, and that's protected in those patients uh, uh, who are randomized to empagliflozin. Uh, I, don't, I don't have these data, but when you stop the drug, the GFR goes back up to its absolute baseline. It's fascinating. I'm actually giving grand rounds in nephrology on Friday, so I'm really <laughs> excited uh, uh, with these data. Okay, so SGLT2s, uh, MACE effect, significant heart failure benefit, and significant benefit on the progression of CKD. Relatively weak glucose lowering medications, probably has nothing to do with glucose, as demonstrated by the DAPA-HF trial. So, four positive trials. Uh, Erdogoflozin is still pending. We'll have that toward the end of the year. So let's talk about the GLP-1s. Now here the physiology is different. The gut makes uh, neuroendocrine peptides uh, that signal the endocrine pancreas. The main ones are glucagon-like peptide 1. It looks like glucagon, but doesn't act like glucagon. Glucagon, if anything, in increases blood glucose. GLP-1s decrease blood glucose. And GIP, which is glucose-dependent, insulinotropic peptide. When I was in medical school, this was gastric inhibitory peptide. So same initials, different names. It's like when you get divorced and you have the monogram sheets, you have to find your second spouse has to have the same. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So um, you, you stimulate the pancreas of both uh, the alpha cells to make less glucagon and the beta cells to make more insulin. So it basically accentuates the normal physiology of the pancreas almost a, as a turbocharge for the pancreas to make more insulin when food is ingested. And just a reminder, DPP-4, these are one of the more uh, commonly used medications, the DPP-4 inhibitors that don't have a cardiovascular benefit. The DPP-4 inhibitors uh, basically degrade the enzyme, DPP-4, that chews up the GLP-1s. So it's kind of a double negative. These are the pills that uh, inhibit the enzyme that uh, destroys your own GLP-1 and GIP, where the GLP-1 agonists are injectable pharmacological doses of uh, uh, compounds that mimic the effects of uh, glucagon-like peptide 1. And again, a risk-benefit ratio. These were more potent A1C reducers, low hypoglycemia risk. Um, they dropped weight to a greater degree. Blood pressure went down. Some effects on albuminuria, some beneficial effects on lipids. Inflammatory markers improved, and there was some basic science data suggesting that these drugs may have a direct salutary effect on the heart itself. So there's a lot of excitement about these drugs potentially being good for the cardiovascular system. Um, but, you know, some risks. Patients don't like to inject. Um, significant GI toxicity, nausea, in some circumstances, vomiting if the dose is titrated up too quickly. Uh, there was a lingering concern of pancreatitis risk. And then in animal models, it increased the risk of uh, rare type of thyroid cancer, medullary carcinoma, which has not, thankfully not been seen in, in humans. So four main trials. Uh, leader with loraglutide was the first. Uh, here showing a, a significant effect on MACE, also an effect on CV death and all-cause mortality. 
the CKD progression effect was there, but it was almost entirely on reduction in macroalbuminuria. And if you talk to nephrologists, they consider this kind of a soft outcome, no effect on the true progression of renal uh, dysfunction in terms of creatinine and, and GFR. Uh, Sustain 6 with semaglutide, this is a weekly injectable formulation, as is exenatide uh, weekly. And um, uh, this is a mistake here, this is rewind trial with dulaglutide. Uh, all showing uh, scattered benefits on some of these cardiovascular outcomes. A little bit more variability from drug to drug, probably related more to study design uh, than to the compound itself. And you'll notice that there is no major effect on heart failure outcomes with the GLP-1 agonist. In, in fact, some small studies in heart failure populations, if anything, the point estimate was above one, suggesting that at least no benefit, maybe, maybe some risk. CKD progression, uh, again, a little bit more variable and almost exclusively on albuminuria, not, again, on uh, decline in GFR. So a little bit more variability here. Uh, Harmony was a study looking at albuglutide, which is actually no longer marketed. Um, but the weekly formulations, dulaglutide and semaglutide, also appear to have a significant uh, benefit on cardiovascular uh, risk. Before I leave the... Uh, uh, the glucose lung therapy is I just wanted to tell you a little bit of a Yale tale. I don't know if Larry Young is in the article, but Larry and I worked with Walter Kernan um, and Kathy Bascoli uh, to develop the IRIS uh, trial. This is the insulin resistance intervention after stroke trial, and it was testing a, a kind of a radical notion at the time, which would be if you took an insulin sensitizing drug, a TZD, a thiazolidine, we use pioglitazone. Very glad we didn't choose rosiglitazone because this was <laughs> during the fiasco of uh, the, uh, the uh, Vandia controversy. So pioglitazone and applied it to not uh, patients with diabetes but patients with insulin resistance. Uh, funny story, I wanted to call it the insulin sensitivity intervention after stroke trial. <laughs> so I was very glad I was overruled on that. Um, so we randomized patients to placebo or pyoglitazone, importantly, non-diabetic individuals. So we were testing this notion as to whether directing um, uh, insulin resistance itself, or I should say improving insulin resistance, would reduce cardiovascular events. And we used a stroke model. So these patients had stroke and, and TIA. Now, if you're ruling out or excluding patients with type 2 diabetes, and you're ruling in or including patients with insulin resistance, you're going to wind up with lots of patients with prediabetes, and that's exactly what we had. But it's not really a prediabetes trial, but it's the first trial that has demonstrated that in a prediabetic population, you could actually reduce cardiovascular events. And this is the primary outcome. Uh, this is a 24% reduction in our primary outcome, which was uh, fatal and non-fatal MI and stroke, essentially, essentially MACE. So what have been the effect of these uh, trials? Not so much iris, which is the non-diabetic population, but in treatment guidelines for diabetes. You remember the dark ages, right, where lifestyle, metformin, you do whatever you want based on pricing, side effects, potential benefits. Now these are the updated ADA, EASD, that's di uh, European Association for the Study of Diabetes a consensus report for managing patients with type 2 diabetes. And it's, it's a bit complex, but I'm just going to focus on step one, which is a very important step, which is asking whether a patient has or does not have cardiovascular disease, specifically ASCVD, uh, heart failure, and or CKD. And according to this algorithm now, if uh, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic disease, predominates the clinical picture, then you are asked to move to a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 inhibitor. No uh, necessarily any guidance as to the choice between those two. Because these are the two categories that have been unequivocally demonstrated to improve cardiovascular outcomes in patients with diabetes who have CVD. If there is heart failure or CKD that pre predominates the clinical picture now, as you know, patients are complex. Very often there's a little heart failure with uh, the uh, atherosclerosis having given them myocardial uh, infarctions and, and 
left ventricular dysfunction. So some of these patients are going to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But if heart failure or CKD is present, then the data would compel the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor. Because as I showed you, the GLP-1s don't seem to have that uh, significant uh, benefit. And now the cardiologists have also gotten involved here. So these are now from the ESC. Now this came out just uh, last fall. And it's a little bit more radical than the, the diabetology guidelines insofar as they recommend that in patients who aren't on any medications just yet, if they have cardiovascular disease or even very high risk, that you don't even stop at metformin, that you should just go with one of these drugs. Kind of radical. And if they're already on metformin and they have cardiovascular disease, then you add the SGLT2, which is equivalent to what the um, ADA recommends. But I would point out that they're including both high and very high risk. And if you read these and you read the footnote here, um, I can't think of any patient with diabetes in my practice who wouldn't be considered high or very high risk. So basically, they're saying you should go with one of these medications. I'm not sure the data is there yet. It's a little bit uh, pushing the envelope, but it's interesting that the uh, uh, cardiologists have very strong views about this. So in the last uh, few minutes, I just wanted to go over a couple of uh, pitfalls and pearls about using the SGLT2 inhibitors, because I feel that you know, these drugs have significant cardiovascular benefits, particularly in a heart failure population. And as I'll show you, I think Mikhail showed this data uh, from our system as well as the St. Luke system in, in Kansas City. You guys see these patients much more than we do. And if we're going to get these medications out there to reduce, I mean, some of these effects are on mortality, right? You should be concerned about that. If we're going to get these medications out there. Uh, the, the use of these medications is still re relatively low. Um, we need help. Right? We need primary care doctors to understand the data and also cardiologists who have not traditionally been comfortable prescribing diabetes medications. But I think, I hope I've convinced you that the data is there. And if you wait for all these patients to see endocrinologists, it's just not going to happen. So let's talk about um, what I view as the major impediments in prescribing these medications and just some tips in terms of how to prescribe them safely. So here are the concerns. <coughs> hypoglycemia, volume depletion, AKI, genitourinary infections, Fournier's gangrene, oh my lord, <laughs> DKA, amputations and fractures. Why in the world would you ever want to prescribe these medications? <laughs> but I'll tell you, these are, these are really minor issues uh, from uh, uh, you know, somebody who's prescribed these medications. Minor issues require some patient education, and you got to know who not to prescribe these medications in. So hypoglycemia, as I've told you before, not a concern. They just don't lead to hypoglycemia because the body will autoregulate itself, drop its insulin secretion, you don't get hypoglycemic. However, if you have a patient who's tightly controlled, so you say, what's your A1C? And they say, I'm doing great, I'm 5.9%, and I'm on insulin, and I'm having hypoglycemia three or four times a week, red flag. If you add an SGLT2 inhibitor to that individual, you're going to decrease the set point, they're going to have more hypoglycemia. So I'm not sure if, if you're the person to make this recommendation. I don't see why not. Or confer with their primary care doctor or their endocrinologist. Adjust the insulin dose a little bit. In DAP-HF, we made a, and this was cardiologists running these tri this trial, we made a very simple recommendation. If the A1C is under 7 and they're on insulin or a cell final urea, consider a dosage reduction, 10 to 20% on the insulin, 25 to 50% on the sulfonylurea. If their A1C is 8.8, .8, you don't need to do that. So as mentioned, the SGLT2s do reduce the GFR a little, but that's OK. It's a little penalty you take for long-term uh, benefit. Very similar to RAS blockers. The CRIT goes up about 3%, and that suggests a plasma volume reduction of 6 to 7%. But there's no increase in AKI. There's still a warning in the labels because of MedWatch reports. But when you look at the clinical trials, AKI episodes actually went down, which is interesting. Not sure why that is, but you'd expect more AKI events in any drug that reduces plasma volume. And there's actually no increase, surprisingly, in volume-related adverse events like syncope, et cetera, hypotension. 
GU infections. Um, so most patients will develop some polyuria in urinary frequency. And a gentleman who's really struggling with BPH and waking up three or four times at night to pee, probably not the best drug, or at least warn them about that. Um, the main side effect, and this is a relative risk of about three to four fold, is genital yeast infections, so mycotic infections, mainly in women and in uncircumcised men. So you have to talk about this, right? Because the guy's going to think he has herpes if you, if you don't warn them. So it's easily treated with uh, topicals. These are antifungals. For some reason, in my experience, most patients have one episode and then don't have another episode. Or maybe they self-treat. Who knows? But it doesn't tend to become a chronic issue. But occasionally, you'll have patients that have had three or four infections, and they just have to come off the, study, uh, off, off the drug. UTIs, theoretical, a risk. But in the large trials, just no imbalance for some reason. However, the patient has a chronic indwelling foley, nephrostomy tubes, a big staghorn calculus, has had urosepsis in the past. There are other drugs. Just, just, just be cautious. But in most individuals who have not had those problems or those procedures, the drugs are relatively safe. Fourniers. So this was, these were um, case reports that came up. Uh, most of us feel this may be a reporting bias, but it's a very serious infection, so it needs to be uh, considered seriously. Um, reporting bias, because if you saw a patient with Fourniers and is on insulin, who's going to report that, right? Because this is uh, not an uncommon situation. Well, it's, it's rare, but it's seen in patients with diabetes. But if you have a patient on an SGLT2 inhibitor, every physician knows that there's something to do with the genital urinary system, right? So the first thing you think of is, could it be the drug? It could be, but I, I think that in the first uh, uh, case reports that were sent through MedWatch to the FDA that comprised their uh, warning announcement last year, uh, there were 12 cases reported with SGLT2 inhibitors, zero with other drugs. And there was an exposure of 1.7 million people in the United States. And if you do the math, that's about actually what the rates of Fourniers is, it's about one per 100,000. So something to keep an eye on. I probably would avoid the drug in at-risk patients. Anybody who is hugely obese, hospitalized, bed-bound, uh, poor hygiene, uh, again, chronic and dwelling follies, the, the, these may be setups. But I think for routine patients, this is little concern, although you hear it on the advertisement on the TV, and it becomes you know, obviously very, very concerning for, for patients. DKA is interesting. So, this emerged in the off-label use in type 1 diabetes. So the drug actually works in type 1. It it's, doesn't need insulin to work. It'll pull glucose out if you're type 1 or type 2. Um, so endocrinologists figured this out and they started using it in type 1 until there emerged these reports of diabetic ketoacidosis. Interestingly, it's euglycemic DKA, meaning that the glucose is not that high. And this really plays a trick on emergency room physicians because a type 1 patient comes in vomiting, dehydrated. They think DKA. What do they do? They'll check a glucose finger stick, and it's like 180. And they'll say, it can't be DKA. Then the chemistries come back, and there's a metabolic acidosis. There's ketones. It is DKA, but it's euglycemic. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting uh, complication of type 1 uh, diabetes off-label use in SGL, with SGLT2 inhibitors, which I'm not recommending uh, at this time. It can happen in type 2, um, but these are type 2s that look like type 1s. So they're lean, they're on insulin, they may actually have autoimmune diabetes, something we call LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. This is type 1 diabetes occurring in an older uh, individual. So just to be sure, uh, be very careful during illness, because this is what happens. The patients become sick. In type 1s, their pump breaks, they skip an injection, and they develop DKA. If you're using these drugs in type 2, they should be worn. When they're sick, they should stop the medication. <coughs> and even in the post-operative uh, or the pre-operative setting, <coughs> should say, uh, we recommend stopping the med medication two to three days before because some of the type 1 DKAs have occurred in the post-op setting. So you just have to be careful uh, in these uh, patients, even in patients with uh, type uh, 2 diabetes. The rates are pretty low. Um, this is a study that was published a couple of years ago 
looking at a large healthcare database, DPP4 inhibitors, which don't increase DKA and SGLT2 inhibitors that do. And you can see that the S excess risk is about two to three per thousand. When I talk to endocrinology groups, I use the analogy of the risk of A granulocytosis with methimazole, which is in this range, about two to three per thousand. So it can occur, but I'm not sure. I, I think it's overwhelmed by the potential cardiovascular benefits, particularly in an ASCVD population. Amputations, a single study, CANVAS. Uh, there was a doubling, still not clear why, because other canticle flows and studies have not shown this. Um, could it be a manifestation of hemoconcentration and sludging? We just don't know. But other studies with other SGLT2 inhibitors have not, not found this. However, I tend to avoid the medications just in case in patients that have had amputations or have significant severe PVD. I know, I know your patients with cardiovascular disease often have PVD or PAD, I should say. But I think in an abundance of caution, somebody with threatened toes, if you know what I mean, I think they're probably not a great drug class to use. We have, we have the GLP ones that you can use. And Canvas, again, I'm sorry, fractures was seen again in Canvas, um, which was a canticle flows in study. Something funny with that study, uh, because it's not been demonstrated in other uh, canticle flows in studies, nor with other SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. So allow me to conclude. Um, I hope I've convinced you that correcting the major metabolic abnormality of type 2 diabetes, hyperglycemia, doesn't do a lick for cardiovascular endpoints. And older glucose-lowering therapies, metformin, SUs, insulin, by <coughs> themselves also don't reduce cardiovascular outcomes. So with all this controversy, in 2008, FDA told industry basically do large CV outcome trials, mainly focusing on safety, not necessarily efficacy. But the companies were smart, right? They, they added a few couple of extra thousand patients to power the studies for efficacy because some of the compounds actually showed early signals of potential cardiovascular benefits in animal and, and early human trials. So the first series of these trials, the DPP4 inhibitors were essentially neutral, so safe but not effective for cardiovascular disease. And since then, there's been uh, two main categories, SGLT2s and GLP1s. And I'll throw in the TZD pioglitazone because of the, uh, the IRIS study that we coordinated have beneficial cardiovascular effects. So the old uh, concept that you can't do anything for cardiovascular disease through glucose lowering is not true. It's not actually through glucose lowering, perhaps, but it's using glucose lowering medications that are somehow having these off-target effects, but who cares? The patient doesn't care, but uh, they're, they're having benefits on the cardiovascular as well as the renal uh, system. And um, over just the past three or four years, so this is a rapidly evolving space, uh, there have been major changes in how the professional societies recommend that we treat patients with diabetes, especially those patients with CVD, heart failure, and uh, with CKD. And I'll leave you with this slide that Mikhail showed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is uh, a very simple analysis using EPIC both here and at uh, Mikhail's system at St. Luke's in Kansas City. Uh, the bottom line is these are patient touches from cardiology in blue and endocrinology in red. And you can see that if you have coronary artery disease seen in either of these two large health systems, you have nearly a five-fold greater I want to say risk, greater chance, <laughs> a risk. greater chance of, of seeing one of you than one of me. And if you have heart failure, it's even worse or better. Uh, it's, it's, it's seven to one. So again, the point is, is that the, the patients are in your practices and getting this information out there, not necessarily prescribing them uh, these medications, although I think you, you probably should, but at least having that discussion that at least directing them back to their PCP or their endocrinologist to talk about could their diabetes regimen be tweaked to advantage the cardiovascular system. And I think with that, I will uh, conclude. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> for the questions. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Um, 
there's a, we use tacrolimus uh, calcineurin inhibitors for our transplant patients. We only use kidney uses and liver uses them, and they cause so they cause increased sodium resorption. They cause diabetes. They cause renal failure um, and left ventricular hypertrophy. So, um, are you are you aware of any data that anybody has looking at the interaction here? I know I know some uh, transplant centers are. are Beginning to use the medications, but with an absence of, of data. Obviously, the you know there's an in, there's a greater infection concern in those patients on immunosuppressives. I don't see how that would necessarily. I mean, you just don't see the UTIs of urosepsis uh, that we anticipated initially. That if you put these drugs in a large group of older patients with diabetes, that you start to see more pylo and urosepsis. We've, we've not seen that at least in the clinical trials. Remember, clinical trials. They're unique patients that get into these trials. They tend to be a little bit healthier, perhaps, than what we see in the general population. So that would be my only concern, is that if there's a signal for uh, infection risk. I don't know of any drug-drug interaction, so it, it, should, it should be something that's studied. Because any time the drugs have been used in a heart failure population, there appears to be a benefit. So um, one summary. My, my first question is, when you give renal grand rounds on Friday, where are you going to position a nephrologist? And the cardiologists. So they're not, they're not as, you know, nephrologists are an interesting group. They're kind of serious, and the, the, the talk, Jeff, is just uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and the nephrologists. Okay. No jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Taking it easy. So the other question is you know, and, and every time I see these data and you present these data, I'm I'm really fascinated by the early divergence in the event curves. Um, and maybe it's hemodynamic. Um, and it is interesting that the change in hematocrit approaching the hazard ratio or improvement towards the hazard ratio is really remarkable that it's the single most. Uh, so, so again, maybe it's hemoconcentration, but you mentioned that EPO, which potent levels are, are elevated. And, Pretty my size and the endothelium both have EPO receptors, and this whole family of uh, growth factor and growth factor receptors is is self protective, if you will. So has anyone looked at that or tried to address that? And I guess are there mouse models in type two diabetes where these drugs can be tested? Because you could knock out the EPO receptor. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no reason these drugs do work in animal models. You know, that this this SGLT2 was discovered because there was a, a genetic mutation in a family that basically had gly glycosuria, and uh, none of them had diabetes, and they were missing the SGLT2. So they were polyuric and they passed uh, uh, glucose through their urine, um, but that's how it was discovered. I I, I assume that there's an I, I know actually that I know there are knockout. Uh, models in, in, in urine species looking at that. But you're asking a, di a different question, not which is not going to add that, I, that I, 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 I can't tell you. But, you know, in, in DAP AHF, we just are, are uh, submitting this for publication, the, um, the significance for heart failure worsening, which was heart failure hospitalization and then urgent heart failure, outpatient heart failure visits requiring IV therapy or CV death occurred at, I think it was 22 days. And that's where you start to see this. Uh, so I, th I think it's, it's hemodynamic. Jeff thinks it's hemodynamic. There's this interesting ketone hypothesis. I'm not sure if you've heard this. I kind of blew through this. But when you use these drugs, beta-hydroxybutyrate goes up in a micromolar amount. And this is one of the reasons type 1s actually can go into DKA. But in type 2s, it's a, it's a tiny amount. And um, maybe you, you probably have some thoughts about this. I know Larry uh, does not uh, feel this is significant, but there's some, oh, there, sorry, Larry. Um, maybe you should speak to this, is that the question is whether ketones are a more efficient fuel source. I'm out of my league here, but more efficient fuel source for the cardiac, particularly the ischemic uh, heart, uh, than glucose or free fatty acids. So <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion about the ketone hypothesis. <clears throat> And um, the efficiency argument, I think, is bogus, but the metabolic <laughs> argument actually is real, which is that in heart failure, you get altered both glucose and fatty acid metabolism, and the enzyme that metabolizes ketones is actually highly upregulated 
It's the hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase. And so the, the heart failure heart is primed. It wants to see ketones. And so even this <coughs> 0.5 uh, millimolar increase could actually be significant. It's something that we're studying now with Jerry Shulman. Just, um, just a, a point about that. I know it's getting late, but um, there's a group in Texas, actually Ralph DeFranzo's group, who uh, is publishing or has recently published data looking at this specific issue in non-diabetic individuals. And according to them, they don't see any changes in beta-hydroxybutyrate in non-diabetic individuals. Remember DAPHF, there was absolutely no difference between the diabetic and the non-diabetics. We're going to be measuring ketones on, on saved plasma. My personal view is that it has nothing to do with, uh, with ketones. It's all hemodynamic. Yeah. Um, There's no question hemodynamics is 90%, but they're not mutually exclusive. And I would agree the ketone effect in non-diabetics is minimal. But in diabetics, it can be 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimolar. That's non-trivial. And it needs to be looked at as the bottom line. Without question. Eric. Wonderful talk. We're out of time. Um, the, I'm curious if you and John and others are looking at this concept. So when you look at those curves that are so quickly, obviously there could be uh, you know, some dynamic effect, as Jed and others, and I, and I think I would also agree, uh, believe, but there would also be the removal of a potential hazard. And so potential um, hazard. Something that you know may be causing events, and now you've removed. So, so, and we moved it quickly. So the question I have is, you know, there is a, a fair bit of literature suggesting that diuretics have a negative effect, uh, but we have no alternative. This is, I, I hate to use the term, but an expensive diuretic in some sorts, right? And so, is Jeff, Jeff here. <laughs> is there, uh, so, 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 is there <laughs> some data from EMPA and from that that you and John are looking at that look at the interaction on diuretic reduction? Yeah, there, there's a modest reduction in diuretics, but in, in DAPHF, we've not looked at that in Empereg, um, but in DAPHF, there was a modest reduction in, in, in diuretics. Uh, I'm not sure that's the explanation for what we're seeing here. It's a very, very small, small change. Um, if you talk to Jeff, and Jeff has some really exciting data that's uh, been submitted for publication, and um, as you probably have heard from Jeff, he feels that it's a unique diuretic because of the blockade of sodium, which is really early in the nephron. And by now increasing sodium delivery to the macula, it seems to attenuate the normal uh, counter-regulatory neurohormonal effects of, of the volume depletion. Uh, I, I actually think this is where the money is, that get, you're depleting the plasma, offloading the ventricle, without the increase in ADH, in renin, in aldo, in, or as much, I should say, um, in catecholamines. There's a, sympatholyt a sympatholytic effect of these medications. So what if you could take a diuretic that reduces plasma volume by 6 to 7%, but without activating the neurohormones? Would that be a perfect diuretic, particularly in, in, um, in combination with, with, with a loop? Maybe reducing the loop dose, that's the, 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 the working hypothesis, at least Jeff's, who's thought about this a lot. I'm a little bit out in the league here, but um, I think that's probably where the money is. What I don't understand is why you don't get more volume-related AEs, because you'd think that if you don't, I mean, the neurohormones are there to support blood pressure, right? So in an older population of patients with stiff ventricles and stiff heart and, and stiff vasculature, if you're volume depleting them without the compensatory increase in heart rate, et cetera, why don't you get more syncope? That I don't know, which is a little bit of a, of a, of a conundrum. Um, I, I think the EPO question is interesting. Um, but again, and just going back to medical school, if, if you take anyone with a hematocrit that is normal, 40, 40, 41, and you increase it to 43, 44, would, would that um, increase oxygen delivery to the extent that could explain I don't think so, but m maybe. But EPO, delivering or raising EPO levels may not be the same thing as transfusion, so that's what I'm But it didn't work in, in CKD, right? It did not yeah. reduce yeah, mortality, and so, so, yeah. so I, I'm not sure that's the answer. It's like 10 weeks. It's a transient bump in EPO that goes away. Hi, Lee. Hi, Lee.
So perhaps that, um, maybe one last question, then we'll have. Uh, we'll have. This will be a great, great talk. So you showed that the cardioprotective effects seem to be related vis-a-vis -vis risk factors to hemoconcentration. What about the renoprotective effects in the same cohort? All right. So this is this is very, this is even more interesting. Um, so the, the best data suggests that you know how the RASP blockers uh, open the uh, efferent arterial, but I guess that's the that's the felt to be the mechanism of action. They dilate the for an arterial, which then decreases glomerular pressure. This does uh, the opposite in terms of the vasculature, but the same in terms of the glomerular pressure. It, it constricts the afferent arterial, again, probably through delivery of sodium to the macular densa. So by decreasing blood flow to the glomerulus, it does the same thing to decrease glomerular balance. Now, you'd think that if that were the case, that if you use it in combination with the RAS blocker, that you'd have a lot more AKI, and you don't. You get the same benefit. But it's like RAS blockers will open up the afferent. This decreases the efferent. And the, the bottom line is that you decrease uh, the mayor pressures. And that's why you get that initial hemodynamic drop in, in uh, GFR, and presumably why you preserve the function. That's the best explanation I've heard, but there are conflicting very interesting. This whole class has changed our